Good morning uh, again. Uh, calling the meeting to order. I'm Zachary Epps, uh, co-chair of the policy committee. Uh, I will start us off by taking roll, uh, starting with the members of the uh, committee. Uh, Miss, uh, Mrs. Julie Haywood. Uh, present. Miss Jennifer Lohman. Here. I see Mr. Daniel Schultz as well, uh, who we can make note. Um, I think you have I a. No, I think that change will occur starting next month. So I think right so now. I haven't. If we could just, since the recording, we could just make note of the change, which there will be a change in uh, committee membership uh, moving forward. We have both folks here today, but Miss Jennifer Lohman uh, will be an official member of the policy committee. Uh, Mr. Daniel Schultz uh, is. Well, we'll shift off of the policy committee in the official capacity. Uh, and so, as Mr. Schultz mentioned, uh, that change will take official next month. I saw both of you here today. Uh, so, um, but for uh, members of the administration and any viewing members of the public, uh, a moment that's, that's what you're having. Uh, so we will continue with our agenda for with the approval of last meeting's minutes from March 23rd, uh, 2022. Uh, I'll await uh, the motions to be. I move to approve those minutes, uh, Ms. Reps. Julie Haywood. Second, Jenny Lohman. All in favor of approving the minutes from last month's meeting? Aye. Aye. All right, uh, thank you. We'll move forward uh, to the presentation. I'll hand it over to the uh, school district administration. Oops, sorry. Okay, I'll share my screen, pull up policy uh, 011. One second. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, and I'm looking at policy zero eleven. Okay. So policy zero eleven principles for governance and leadership is up for adoption for our May 10th board meeting. There were not any changes made um, since last policy meeting. So did anyone have any questions or any updates? Not seeing any hands uh, from the board. Uh, oh, and there we go, Mr. Schultz. Um, I just wanted to, and the answer can be yes. Uh, the phrase with an equity lens, I wanted to just sanity check, does that, the, the concept of a with a lens, I know what it means. And I know on a board where we talked about what, what through an equity lens means. Would would does that phrase mean what we what it means to us? Will it mean what it means uh, to other people looking at it? Is, is that a common enough? I, and it may well be, but versus something more specific like um, that, consider the you know equitable needs of our. Of, or so, I know it'd be longer, but um, that was all. And it's wordsmithing. I'm happy to, to defer. I imagine this would not be a substantive change, hopefully. If it would be, then I'm dropping it. No. The, the suggestion is just rewording that. It wouldn't be a significant change. Not reverting. Um, keeping with an equity lens, something like it, but, but having it instead of just be with a lens, um, have it be something specific 
that like what does that mean what does it mean to view something through an equity lens sort of taking that next level of definition so can i so i, I see miss hey oh I, yeah I was gonna oh, i'm sorry mr Act. i was to, just yeah no yeah go ahead if, if it's yeah. so i'm sorry i'm mr schultz i'm thinking um, possibly develop, adopt, revise, and review policy from an equity perspective, consistent with our equity policy. Maybe something like that would be clearer. I think that would be perfect. Uh, that would absolutely address the concern. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry I came with a with a question without any concrete idea, but I'm glad we have a committee to address that. That's exactly why we have a committee. <laughs> Thanks for bringing it up. It'll be from an equity perspective. Mm -hmm. Consistent with our equity policy. And while, um those updates are being made in real time, <laughs> I will note in committing to the rest of this document, and I'll even point to last night's education affairs meeting in terms of what it looks like uh, to pursue equity in terms of the comprehensive planning and special education planning that we heard about, the use of disaggregated data that we see there under evaluate continuously. And so I do see uh, to your, the question around common language, I'm not really addressing that, but uh, I, I, I do see where that is lived even throughout this document. Um, and want to mention even the efforts the administration is taking, uh, even what we heard last night to, to pursue equity along different categories, along multiple categories. So thank you, look at that, perfect timing. Uh, right there to the updates were made. Uh, and so I, um, I don't see any other board uh, virtual hands raised or um, anything coming in from any attendees. And then we, Ms. Haywood, Mrs. Haywood. Um, Jess, um, excuse me, um, Ms. Jackson, it would be from an equity perspective. And I'll tell you, I hate to type in front of other people because I usually am like. <laughs> <laughs> no, no problem. Okay. Um, so develop, adopt, revise, and review policy from an equity perspective. Consistent. Yeah, not prospective, but perspective. Oh, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. <laughs> like I said, every time I'm typing in front of other people, I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> so many things go wrong. <laughs> no problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. All right. And then if you're comfortable, we could probably comfortable moving forward. I think the so this policy is ready to, since it's not a significant change, is ready for adoption for our May 10th meeting, board meeting. And should I go to the next policy now? Yes, thank you. So that would be 914. 914 is for repeal, um, as you can see, the language is included in other policies and we listed the other policies in ARs, uh, 212, 213, 829, 916, 918, 921. So um, all of this information is listed in those policies. Open it up for any board comments. Seeing uh, no hands or opening up for public participation. I'm checking there are no current attendees, so I will uh, pass it back to uh, Ms. Jackson. Thank like you. We are, as you mentioned, that this would as well go forward for the May 10th agenda for repeal. Yes. Uh, hand it back so the next policy for adoption is 
policy in AR 216. And there were not any significant changes made. There weren't any changes made since our last policy meeting. And this policy is assignment within the district. All right, opening up for uh, board comment. You have Mr. Schultz, sir. Mr. Schultz, thank you. Thank you. Um, I see the line, this is a question, maybe more about the AR um, and also a general question. I see the line about the superintendent that yeah, superintendent or designee shall periodically review existing attendance areas, et cetera, et cetera. It's under delegation of responsibility. First, is that when we've talked about the concept of redistricting, is that what that line is referring to? Is that essentially what that review would mean? Um, I think that's a question for administration, just to make sure I'm mapping that line to the, the term that I'm familiar with. That, that's how I'm reading it, Mr. Okay. Shaw. And then my second question is, is there a best practice around frequency of redistricting um, in terms of, I know redistricting is a huge complex and sometimes controversial because it's disruptive uh, thing. I also understand that it's it's something that uh, has benefit because it, in terms of operational eff effectiveness as a district. Um, and I also know that we haven't done it in quite some time. And my question is, would it be helpful for, not in the policy, I imagine, but in the administrative regulation to, to specify what periodically means in terms of a goal, um, once every 10 years, once every, I, and, and then I don't know, should it be every 10 years? Should it be more frequently, less frequently than that? Um, that I, is I, don't, I don't know if we want to actually quantify that. I, I, I think by leaving it to the discretion of the superintendent or designee, it can happen whenever needed. And, and I, I think that that's how it, it, it should remain. Um, you know, true transparency. I mean, I'm looking at enrollment numbers. When we sit, we're looking at projection numbers, enrollment numbers. As we're looking at capital improve, improvement with facilities, if you put the right person in this seat, that's something they're going to do because they're seeing the trends, there's implications. So I, I just think it being a fluid process and fluid dialogue, um, that may also be a Ed Diazio question around, is there a frequency standard that other districts uh, locally are potentially using? Um, a 10 year would just be, you know, uh, too far out. So. I think if you approach it from the stamp, minimally speaking, every three or every, I mean, that, that would make sense, but let, let's uh, pose that uh, with our solicitor and, 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 and circle back with some feedback if that's something you want to push, but I, I, I really feel that. That makes total sense. And just to uh, double underscore, I think that um, my question wouldn't need to delay anything of this process because it was really a question of would it make sense to have that in the AR? So I think I would love to have that follow-up question from Mr. Diazio of, of are there standards um, if the if others in the committee are interested in that. Um, but I also don't I don't want it to hold anything up. Um, right. And your answer does satisfy me. I you know I think the the other part of it though is is our district hasn't. I mean, and Dr. Smith, you have actually a longer uh, memory of this than I do. I don't believe we have done. A redistricting in quite some time and so and her hands up so yes. let's, let's let doc go ahead and ad address uh her perspective good morning um i agree with everything that uh dr scriven stated in terms of um being cautious about putting a timeline on redistricting and you're right mr uh, schultz it is a huge 
undertaking um, with time and as well as finances, and it should be under, it should be, go, it, 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 we should do that under um, advisement whenever we do um, attempt that. What I do want to add is um, annually, my office reviews all of the enrollment at all of the classes and all of the schools. We look at all of the enrollments by grade to see if um, there is any um, shifts or any need to start to look at um, how many students are going to each school. And so far we have not, um, during my time here, we have not seen any um, significant increases or decreases in enrollment that would require us to redistrict. Um, specifically, we did have one of our elementary principals express concern that um, their numbers were going down um, significantly and brought up the redistricting conversation we did an internal audit and found that that was not founded. So I do want to say that we do have a process every year um, where uh, we give the superintendent, I want to say around mid-May, early June, we give um, the ending numbers for this year. And once registration starts to roll in, we give projected numbers for next year. So we do review enrollment every year at each school to make sure that there isn't um, any particular heavy overflow, uh, so to speak, or underflow at any of the schools. So we we that does happen annually. Thank you. And and I see Mr. Diazzo is on. If, I, if he's connected, I would pose it to him. But also, I will. Well, Dr. Smith, based on what you just said, you know, it's again reading that paragraph. It is reviewing and recommending proposed changes, which might not actually always raise like that process of review. If it doesn't yield any proposed changes, I don't know if that's technically redistricting, but that does happen on an annual basis. And that, that's great to hear. So yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, so I want to be clear. I'm not suggesting that we have a redistricting conversation every year. I'm suggesting that we review the data annually, which would lead to a redistricting re recommendation if the data supports it. So far, we have not seen that. And again, that, that process is not only generated by my office, but principals also um, during the close of school year also asked to give any feedback about any trends or any, um, any uh, unusual movement in their schools that may require um, either additional teachers, less teachers, or movement of a grade, movement of... Um, changing around we we I want to say like three years ago we looked at how we assigned students from Linwood Gardens to our schools to make sure that those numbers are still um pretty equitable so we don't do a redistricting every year but we absolutely rule we absolutely review enrollment at all of our schools every year in the in the in the case that we may need to redistrict so we haven't made those recommendations because they haven't been needed but we do an annual review in preparation for a possible redistricting conversation. That makes a lot of sense. Um, Mr. Diazio, the question that I raised was whether it is, uh, whether districts have best practices. I mean, my original question was, was about us specifically, but that it evolved into a question for you about whether districts have um, in their ARs best practices around specific timelines for the review of enrollment data and specifically for redistricting? Do districts have, you know, in policy or AR that a redistricting shall occur or be, you know, be seriously explored on a, on a regular cadence or is that generally left um, to the discretion? I've never seen um, language written about a timeline for redistricting because it's, it's fairly rare that you would do like a district-wide redistricting. Um, districts that do it, um, sometimes they'll do it and then you might not have to do it for 15 or 20 years. Um, you know, I think what a lot of districts do is what I think I heard Dr. Smith saying is you, you take a look at it, um, you know, and, and generally all in all it balances out or is pretty close to balancing out. Um, so I would say I'm not used to seeing that language in an AR. Right, thank you. Yep. And my last comment, and I will lower my hand, is is I do wonder if the process you just described, Dr. Smith, of review, you know, insofar as it is, uh, frankly, it is what you just described is very responsive to this first clause. And I wonder if codifying that process 
in the AR would be appropriate, just explaining, yes, on an annual basis, you know, what, what does periodically review mean? Well, in our case, it means on an annual basis, we review the data. It's not redistrict. You don't even, we don't need to use that word because I've, it's not, it means just that review. Um, and that's all, that's my only comment. Thank you. May I respond to that? May I respond to your comment, Mr. Schultz? I still think periodic is the correct language rather than annual because again, by request, we have reviewed um, the enrollment at schools based on principal request. Um, I remember since I've been here, we had a community member request. So it happens more often, it happens as often as it needs to happen, but it definitely happens annually. So I think periodically captures it better because it isn't, we don't always wait the full calendar year to review. Understood. And, and I, I'm, I'm fine moving on, but I will just say that codifying the process you described, however you would codify it, might have value in, in an AR, not in the policy, um, in terms of ensuring that whatever best practices are being followed now continue. That's, that's, that was my only. But I, I Adrian, can, we, can we just look at what's in the AR right now under this policy? I think it's just the classroom placement of twins. Yeah. So this There's a reason why this is here. So obviously, this has been a, a, a concern in 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 the district. Um, I mean, board response, Mrs. Haywood, and, and and Mr. Epps. I'm not trying to facilitate your meeting. Yeah. I'm just, because this is a it's kind of laying in our lap right now. I just want to make sure I'm clear uh, with the ask uh, from the board at this point. Um, if that's okay, sir. Yeah, and you've pulled up the administrative review um, at this point. I do want to, um, and I believe Mr. Schultz uh, last his request. So I don't know if that satisfies the request. We can um, move forward. I do recognize there as, for the record, we've already heard the voice of uh, Mr. Ed Diazio, the solicitor. We've also been joined by uh, a board director, Leah Mulhern, uh, make mention of that for the record. Uh, Ms. Haywood, um, your hand yes, is up. Yes, thank you, Mr. Know. Epps. Um, so from my perspective, I believe the language in the policy is adequate um, based on what Dr. Scriven has shared and Dr. Smith has shared. I think it's important to give the discretion to administration um, to be able to, again, periodically, meaning uh, whenever they believe it, it really is appropriate to look at um, the attendance areas and determine any proposed changes. And I don't necessarily look at that first sentence under delegation of responsibility as a wholesale opportunity to evaluate redistricting. It could be looking at um, attendance in a particular area of the school district um, and moving students you know, from one school to another, or because there's, um, like, for example, when Glenside was rebuilt, we had um, a lot of people that were coming back to the district, and we had to then evaluate if there were um, more than enough students in terms of capacity of the school that warranted uh, changing some bus routes around. And so I look at that first sentence as possibly opening up for redistricting, but also other opportunities um, short of redistricting that would occur really just on a regular basis based on review of data. And Mr. Schultz, in terms of adding language to the AR, um, you know, what I, because that the AR really only specifically talks about classroom placement as it relates to twins and higher order, um, you know, twins in a classroom, we may want to add language at the very someplace in this AR 
that says the district um, that you know the superintendent and or designee um, on a you know regular basis evaluates the attendance um, within you know each school and in the district overall and maybe just keep it like that I mean just as a very high level because I think that that does although I would ask Mr. Diazio to wordsmith that um, I think it does address what Dr. Smith says does occur on a regular basis and provide some latitude under the policy um, based on current practice. Mr. Diaz, did you unmute? Did you want to respond to that or did? Um... Um, no, I, I can, okay. I mean that, cool. no, I don't have anything necessarily to add, sorry. No, I thought you unmuted, sorry about that. Um, all right, thank you for that, Ms. Haywood. Uh, Mr. Schultz, I see your hand is now raised. Yeah, just to say that 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 sounds fine. I also will note that we don't, if, if repeating that, um, yeah, that, that sounds fine. And the, the only thing is uh, my understanding from our curriculum audit was that part of why I was asking this question was that being very specific in our policies is was a flagged item um, of improvement and periodic to me could I mean it could mean one year it could mean five years it could mean 50 years that those are all periodic um, and so if our intent is to specify that the practice of this district is to review this on an annual or biannual or whatever it is um, I think that specificity does have value so and I will truly conclude with that comment but thank you and to say what your suggestion uh, does does align with with what I was had in mind. I, I just want to I just want to jump in and say that there is a difference with governance versus operations and policies are governance and we do not have to go in the weeds with every policy it's up to us on the administrative side to handle how it's operationalized and I, I don't think we need to go tit for tat uh, in, in scenarios like this. Um, if we say that there's a process, it's part of scheduling and something that we do every year and sometimes happens more frequently than annually, we need that latitude to do the work exactly like that. And I, I just want to strongly iterate that at this time. Understood. And may I please respond, though, uh, Mr. Epps? Uh, go ahead, go ahead, Mr. Thank you. I, I understand that. And I'm talking about the administrative regulation, which I understood to be operational. And, and I don't mean to be coming off as tit for tat. I, I just. No, but, but Mr. Schultz, the, the, the wording. The periodic wording is not under, that's under the policy. That's not under the AR, if I'm correct. And Absolutely. I'm, and I'm not proposing we change that wording, nor have I at any point proposed we change that wording. I'm suggesting that in the AR, we could be more specific in order to- Oh, do we state it. And Ms. Haywood, she, she clearly articulated that, and Mr. Diazio is going to work on that. So yeah. we're on the same page from that standpoint. Uh, Ms. Ms. Loman. Um, is it our, I have a different question that's not related to the, <laughs> the thing is, we were just talking but about. But still it. related to 216? Yes. <laughs> please, please, Ms. Loman. Um, the reference to the placement of um, homeless youth, I just wanted to make sure that we, if could we reference our policy about homeless youth? I think it's 259. I can't, don't quote me on that exactly, um, if that would be okay. Um, the, the only other thing I would suggest in that is, um, there it is. I'll oh, it's there. You. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, it, and this is not for this, but just whenever we review that policy again or whatever, I mean, the terminology these days is more, and I know homeless youth comes from the McKinney-Vento Act, but it's also, it's youth experiencing homelessness. Um, that's really kind of the, the, the way that, you know, that, 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 children who are adults or anybody who's experiencing homelessness is kind of referred to these days. And so I just sort of 
put that in there as a pin. So whenever we look at the homeless youth policy, again, we just think about that. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, there were a few head nods. I don't know if you noticed that. Oh, yep. Um, and uh, affirmations. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Loman. Uh, and certainly for the encouragement for people first language. Uh, there, uh, for, for the record, we will open it for, we'll open up for public comments. Um, seeing no current attendees, uh, I'll hand it. This would move forward uh, for adoption at the May 10th, um, yeah, May 10th. Um, legislative meeting. I'll hand it back over to administration uh, to move forward to the next policy. Okay, and the AR 216, um, once Ed uh, makes that or adds that language that was suggested, then that'll go, that will be posted. Understood, thank you. The Next policy on the agenda under old business is two policy NAR 207, confidential communications uh, of students. This one has not changed since last month. Um, just to refresh the committee's memory, we're still waiting on um, an advisory opinion from the US Department of Education regarding some language around um, transgender rights, particularly how you handle um, parent rights and student rights when parents and students are not on the same page with respect to gender identity issues. And it's tricky to navigate because what we're seeing a lot of these days is students requesting uh, a preferred name, preferred pronouns, preferred gender. And with and, and in connection with those requests, they're, they're sort of twofold. They request that they be known by those names and those pronouns and those um, genders that match with their preferred names, pronouns, and genders. But then they also, uh, as part of that request, need to request amendment of records, um, which would be changing their name and pronouns and um, gender in the student information database, on report cards, possibly on special education documents. And the, the interests that we're balancing there are the students' rights to be in a non-discriminatory environment, but the parent rights under FERPA with respect to amending records are the parent rights until the student is 18. And the US Department of Education has not really given great guidance publicly to school entities on how to merge those two things. Um, so we did request an advisory um, opinion from them, which I hope to have, I hope to have it by this meeting, but they're, it's taking a little bit longer. The reason I say all of that is because in the AR for confidential communications with students, one of the topics that I had planned to address in the AR was what do school staff do with information that they learn from students regarding identity issues? And so we don't have that opinion yet. Um, so what I would say is this AR is fine for now. The policy is, is fine, but it could very well be that in a month or two months, this AR is coming back to the board for a little bit of further tweaking. Uh, we also have the transgender students policy on the agenda today. My sincere hope is that by the time that policy gets to a second read, we do have that um, opinion, but we don't necessarily need to slow down the 207 um, if the committee doesn't want to, because it's just an AR and we can easily bring that back um, at a future time, as long as the committee's comfortable with that approach. So that's the, that's the context for this one. Thank you for that, uh, Mr. Diaz, Mr. Diaz, Ms. Jackson. Uh, open up for uh, board comments. Uh, Mrs. Haywood. 
Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Epps. Uh, Mr. Diaz, I really appreciate that. And I really do appreciate the request for an advisory opinion. Um, that way we have in writing what the US Department of Education's guidance is as it relates to this very important issue. Mm -hmm. um, given the fact that we also have the transgender policy on our agenda today, and with the hope that by the time we get to second read, um, that will that language we will have from um, the federal government. Um, I don't know if we need to hold up 207 or obviously the AR, which we know we can modify at any point. But I would caution us to the extent that we get to second read with the transgender policy and we haven't had that guidance. We may want to bring it back for a new first read so that we can make sure that it is in compliance with applicable law and also, you know, hopefully very protective of the students' rights as well. That's just my only comment. And I think that makes a lot of sense with respect to that policy. I think that's an advisable uh, course of action. All right. Thank you, Mrs. Haywood. Uh, seeing no other hands raised. Uh, and for the record, I'll open up for public comment uh, and move forward or hand it back over um, to the administration. So I also pulled up the AR. I didn't know if anyone had any specific comments or um, questions regarding the AR. Ms. Haywood? Not, not necessarily with the error, but um, for the policy, I don't recall if we had the cross-reference to uh, policy in AR um, 258. If we don't, then I would suggest that we add that again with the, um, you know, with the, uh, guidance that we are still waiting from the, the federal government, but knowing that that policy will be um, implicated as a result. Yes, we can add, I think that's, we can add that cross-reference. I'll do that now. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, I'll back over to administration. Okay, so with that policy 207, and um, after Ed makes the changes, uh, AR 207 will be on the May board agenda for adoption and the AR to be posted. The next policy is 707.1 for repeal and 707.2 for repeal. The information is both included in policy, the policy 707 itself. So these two policies are up for repeal. Correct. And no, no updates on that since the last meeting. Opening up for uh, board comment. Seeing no hands raised, I will move forward to public comment and uh, also with that move back to administration. Uh, that is 707.1. 707.2 both for repeal uh, and I'm back to move forward uh, Jackson. okay so both those policies will be included on the may board agenda for uh repeal and now we're ready to move on to new business for policy 620 designation of fund balance here we are. 
designation of fund balance, changing the name to just fund balance. And, and I believe this is here because it's more than 10 years old. Yeah, so this policy was last reviewed in 2011, so it had reached that 10 years. And we moved, uh, some of these finance policies were scheduled for May and June of this year, but um, while we had Mr. Linderman's expertise, uh, bumped a couple of them up so that he could um, assist with the review here. So he has looked at, um, we're going to talk about 620, 622, and 610. He's looked at all of them. Um, there's not any major um, changes to uh, the fund balance policy. Um, the one thing that we added um, towards the end under the delegation of responsibility is that um, as you know, part of the budget process every year, um, somewhere on a financial affairs agenda, there should just be a discussion about fund balance so that the board is aware of what the categories of fund balance are, how much money is in each fund, and um, whether or not you know, the reserve should be increased or spent down or reassigned. That was a finding um, in, I believe it was probably an auditor general um, recommendation, not in a Cheltenham audit, but in other audits where they've been recommending that fund balance be something that's discussed annual. So, uh, Mr. Linderman and I worked together uh, to to develop some language here just to contemplate that discussion taking place annually. It doesn't necessarily have to be a formal discussion, but um, my understanding is that as part of the slide deck um, in the financial affairs presentation, at several points during the year, there's slides that talk about how much money the district has in the different fund balances, and, and that would suffice for meeting the audit recommendation. Mr. Diazio, was there any specific language around uh, capital improvement or uh, fund balance if over being over 8% potentially X amount, or that would just fall under that dialogue that we would have annually? There's language in the policy, obviously, that says that the, you know, unassigned fund balance can't exceed the 8%. And there's language in here that permits the, uh, the, the director of business services to ensure that that threshold is not um, exceeded and to make adjustments as part of the audit if any adjustments need to be made to bring the district's numbers into compliance with the uh, standards that are set in the Commonwealth. So there's nothing in here that, that specifically talks about capital. Um, but but there's language around the eight percent. Okay, I so I'd like to pose to the board: do do we need to have something in there that speaks specifically to our commitment to capital when we find ourselves in a position with unassigned funds that we could do so? Because we've. I don't see where we've been strategic potentially with with that commitment, and I, I think that's something that we we definitely need to do. And Chuck and I talked about that um, a little bit. What we what we sort of were talking about was um, should the is it enough to say that the the business manager will recommend. Um, let me let me pull up the language. It says in here that um, contemplates the director of business services making recommendations to modify the level of planned use of general fund commitments and reserves to the full board on an annual basis. Um, I think okay. we wanted to steer clear of language that said if there's any excess funds in a given year, they right. will be sent to the capital fund uh, reserve. But I think from checks based on communication with the board. Yes. Okay, that's fine. I think what he is saying is right now that would be my recommendation, but who knows, like in five years, we could have a different set of priorities or need. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. 
Yep. <laughs> so uh, I want to honor the proposal that you had, Dr. Scriven. Do you still want to have that just open that no. up for discussion at this point, or no. is that conversation? No, I, I would okay. draw that. Uh, proposal. I, I think the board is, is well aware of the need for our capital improvement. So I think as long as we have in there a process for fluid dialogue around the needs of the district, uh, uh, we, we'll, we'll be fine. All right, going to still move forward to open it up for uh, board comment on uh, 620. Certainly appreciate that context um, and even proposal and just to be able to hear that conversation. I certainly appreciate the um, that forethinking in terms of what would we then do <laughs> if it exceeded 8% and then even the fact that th that would give us options, right? In a given year, it may mean capital in another given year, that may mean different types of investments into students um, and those that support students. Um, Moving forward to uh, public, for the record again, public comment, seeing no um, attendees at the moment, uh, I'll pass it back to administration um, to move forward. Okay, if there's not any anything else or any other changes with 620, that'll move on to be a first read uh, at, the, in the, at the May board meeting. The next policy on our agenda is policy 622. Yes, so this is the, um, I believe this policy is currently titled financial reporting and we're proposing changing that to uh, capital assets and GASB statement 34. This is a very technical policy. This is one that the district needs to have for um, compliance purposes. Um, your auditors look for this uh, policy when they come in. The auditor general will look for this policy when they come in and do their um, performance audits uh, every several years. At, at a very high level, this policy talks about how you report um, capital purchases in your financial statements. So uh, things that you're purchasing, like supplies that, that are expended in a short period of time within the year, those don't get capitalized. But when you buy... Um, uh, an expensive piece of machinery, you capitalize that item on your financial statements and then you depreciate it over time. And this policy talks uh, particularly in the AR about financial thresholds, about what, what types of assets get capitalized at what point, how they're reflected on the financial statements, how they're depreciated. Um, very, very uh, nuanced. Mr. Linderman uh, and Ms. Kim in the uh, business office have gone through this. They're um, comfortable with all of the thresholds. And uh, we know from working with, um, you know, the, the auditors in, in prior years and in other places that these thresholds would also meet with their approval. So if there's any specific questions, I can try to answer them. Uh, but that's just generally at a high level what this policy does. context uh, I see Mrs. Haywood. Um, yes, Mr. Diazzi, I am definitely not going to question <laughs> the content of this policy from a uh, professional perspective and a financial perspective, but just a very quick question in terms of the inclusion of works of art and historical treasures as a capital asset. Or do they have to be valued at a certain amount? Um, or is it generally kind of that language covers that with the assumption that they are kind of valuable? Um, and that's in the- um, in under the, the AR number 11, I see, yeah. right? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is suggesting either historical cost or fair value on the date of donation. Um, I don't, admittedly, I don't see this come up all that frequently. So if we could, if I could uh, consult with Mr. Linderman and, and maybe send out an email to the board prior to the board meeting, if that would be acceptable. Yeah, that would be great. I he's just probably, he's probably more, um, 
he can probably more authoritatively weigh in on that. Thank you. Okay, yeah, that just seemed to be somewhat of a kind of a nebulous area. And I would imagine that, yep. you know, there'd have to be some value to that, that work of art. And your question is really about how you determine that value, right? Yeah, as a capital okay. asset. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just making a note here. Great. Thank you for that. Seems no other hand at the moment. Uh, we'll move forward uh, for public comment and back to administration. Um, hand it back over. Okay, thank you. So policy 622 will be included on the May board agenda as first read. And Ed, you said you will let us know if there's any other changes after you speak with um, Mr. Linderman. Yes. The next policy on the agenda is policy in AR 610, which is purchases and the proposed language change would be to change it from purpose um, from purchases to procurement. Yeah, so right now this policy is, um, I actually think um, the policy may be titled one thing and the AR may be titled another thing because I think I see purchases um, as the policy and then purchases subject to bid um, as the 610 AR. Um, I've recommended changing that to a more general policy on procurement because the policy addresses more than just um, bidding. It talks um, also about cooperative purchasing. It talks about how you purchase things that actually aren't required uh, to go out to formal bid, but maybe just require several price quotes or things that fall below even the uh, quote threshold where you can just, where there's no formal um, you know, bidding, bidding requirements. The, um, so the policy is here. Um, it's a general, it, the policy is written very broadly to basically require that the business office comply with applicable law with respect to bidding um, and to solicit bids when they're required by law or may, um, you know, save the district money. Because there are times where even though the district may not be required to go out to bid, uh, there may be reason to believe that doing so may result in uh, cost savings to the district. So that this policy gives the business office the ability to see, uh, to move forward with bidding, um, even if it's not required, if there's a belief that it's in the best interest of the district to do so. Um, there's very general language about electronic bidding since, um, you know, as technology advances, more bidding is done uh, with electronic submissions as opposed to years and years ago where uh, all bidding was done by paper in sealed envelopes that were only opened at a certain time on a certain date. Um, so that the policy contemplates all of those things. If you look in the AR, there it's broken down into several different categories. So um, there is language about items um, furniture, equipment, supplies, and appliances. And then there's a section on procurement for construction, reconstruction, repairs, and maintenance. So the first, um, so and, and the, the requirements are generally the same. The thresholds are the same. The public bidding requirements are the same in terms of, you know, you need to put notice in a newspaper for, uh, you know, a couple times over a course of several weeks. All of those requirements in the AR are more the ins and outs of, of what's required under the school code for bidding. And just so you know, these thresholds um, change annually. And so we added at the beginning of the AR, there's a note that says that the threshold reference below are the current thresholds, which is the case, um, but that annually, if a different threshold is imposed, uh, the new thresholds will apply you know, until the policy catches up. So um, we try to make sure that when we have school districts that do refer to the dollar thresholds in their AR, we, we will recommend that this be reviewed every year. And I'll prompt that 
uh, generally in January or February after the new thresholds come out. They usually get announced in December to go into effect for the following calendar year. And that's all I have to say is background there. Thank you. Uh, Open up for board comment, uh, Mrs. Haywood. Yes, thank you, Mr. Diazio, for that that background. That was really helpful, and it looks like we've kind of built out some of the material language in this policy. The one um, section of the existing six ten that was not brought over, and I'm not sure whether it would be in the policy or the AR. But the original 610 had guidelines for notification of bidding opportunities to ensure equal opportunity. And that was language that the board was, um, uh, was really important to the board to include that we would look at minority-based enterprises, women-owned businesses, disadvantaged business enterprises, and um, veterans and Cheltenham-based operations as a way to basically say that when we're opening up the bidding process, we're using those guidelines to make sure that we are um, looking at an expansive um, group of enterprises in that bidding process. So I would suggest that we retain that language um, in the current revised 610. Okay. And I'm just looking here, I think, and it's just in the the language yeah. guidelines for, if you scroll down, yeah, guidelines for notification of bidding opportunities to ensure equal opportunities. All of that was stricken. Yeah, and I, can, I can look to, over. yeah, and I can look to retain, um, I can look to retain some of that. There are requirements in the law now with respect to use of federal funds, which would be in the federal fiscal compliance policy that talk about all of those things. Um, and all of that's in one of the ARs for your federal fiscal compliance policy is on procurement and all of that language is built in there. I think the reason that I may have suggested um, striking that language was because I wasn't necessarily sure that this procedure was being followed with the district establishing sort of a separate website for new business opportunities and to automatically alert, um, you know, different groups. Um, generally, the, the with respect to non-federal funds, the bidding process is pretty you know, you put it in, you put the ad in the newspaper and people respond. Now, if this is still happening or the board wants to explore doing this, there's nothing wrong with that. I just wasn't sure that this was actually taking place. Yeah, and just to give background, I know Dr. Scriven, you were not here when we um, had this discussion. Um, and again, this is from 2014, um, but this actually initially went to the, um, Financial Affairs uh, Committee, we had a really fairly robust discussion with the um, recommendation of the board that we add this language to this policy because we felt very strongly that um, we wanted to make sure that administration at least you know, followed um, these gu their guidelines, not edicts, but guidelines um, as a way to really bring in a more a diverse group of enterprises for, as part of the bidding process. And so our expectation was that uh, these guidelines were being followed by administration as part of the bidding process. Is, is this under the AR? Yes, I, I think it's the section that's uh, procedures for notifications of bidding opportunities to ensure equal opportunities, right, Mrs. Saywood? Okay. I so. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. I see. I, I see it here. We're 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 we have been following that since I have been here in November and uh, Mr. Holman. I, I mean, we have evidence in that in some of the work that we have already uh, been doing since we've we've started. So I'm. All right. Well, let's let's retain that. Um, let me make a note here. Um, it might actually be that all of that language can just stay in its current form. I'll review it uh, 
but if not, if, if there's nothing that needs to be changed, does the committee have any objection to just retaining that in its entirety? I, I don't, I, I know we've been following that, so. Great. Uh, to, the, to the extent, thank you, Ms. Haywood. Um, certainly appreciate the, the and support and suggestion. To the extent, I do recall this specific topic in a um, facilities committee meeting. And so to the extent, I do know Mr. Diazio alluded, some of it is like the creation of another website and what to do to identify and things like that. And so to the extent that what is being followed or you know could be retained and if there are not things um to mr diazio's point some type of some type of review um and i and i want to actually i do because i remember asking and in that following facilities meeting we saw that there was i i, I don't want to misquote the name but i think it was like first lady uh, a vendor that was used even in that following month mm -hmm. and so we do you know i do i do recognize that dr scriven's point those efforts are being made and so now, i don't what, know yeah to your point mr Epps, i don't know about the whole website and and all of that right. i just know that we're we're looking through the lens of right. um vendors etc like the the individual that was used to do the tinning uh with cedarbrook uh library was a african-american female so uh right. at mr diazzo you may want to circle back to myself and mr holman and sure. we can come up what is and isn't being done um just to make sure that we were living up to the expectation of of what's being memorialized here in this uh ar and what i think i'm hearing from the board is that they just want to make sure that these efforts are being made and whatever efforts we are taking that we're memorializing them, you know, in terms of what we're doing. Again, I just, I saw things in here like, um, you know, preparing a small brochure and listing details, um, placing small ads at conferences to raise awareness. I, I, I wasn't necessarily, I, I yeah. did not believe those things were taking place, but to your point, Dr. Scriven, there are other things that are taking place. So maybe we just need to refine the language to reflect what we're doing. And then maybe we could bring that back to the committee next month to take a look at to see if it's if it's enough, not enough, just right. Um, and we can we could further tweak that. No, that makes sense because some of those things I know we are not doing. The essence of what's captured, we are. Correct. In terms of end result, but it's the how that I question, not not the what. And I leave the how to you. <laughs> uh, and right. we can. What we'll do is uh, so that the policy doesn't have to be held up. We'll we'll retain all of this language in the AR, um, so that by the time the policy next month is going for second reading, the committee will see. Um, a new iteration of the AR next month. All right. Thank you, Mr. Diazio. Uh, we can move forward, seeing no other hands or uh, public attendees. Uh, we can move forward. I'll hand it back over to the administration. Okay, so policy 610 procurement will move forward as a first read. And we will bring back the AR to review uh, for our next policy meeting with that, uh, including the language or after you talk with um, Dr. Scriven and Mr. Holman, it will include at least what we're actually doing to make sure that we're following the board guidelines, correct? Correct. Okay. All right, the next policy in AR are 258. Um, yes, so this is the gender expansive and transgender students policy. Um, very few changes to the short policy here, just a couple cleanup items, non-substantive changes. The real changes here uh, are where the, um, in, in the AR, which is where 
the bulk of the guidelines are. So I can, um, I'll just give a brief highlight of the changes that were made. Um, section A under guidelines, privacy, uh, which relates to privacy, um, we revised some of the language to provide guidance on um, how schools, like we, we added language to say that, you know, school staff members should not be disclosing and redisclosing um, uh, students' uh, transgender or gender expansive identities um, unless they're required to do so. Um, that's that is consistent with all of the current uh, with all of the current guidance. We we know that um, with respect to section B, um, you'll see that we section B used to be titled official records. Um, years ago, when um, PDE was first um, figuring out how to navigate um, transgender student requests with changing records and reporting to PDE for official purposes, um, there was this sense that there was sort of the quote official records, which would be like a high school transcript and, um, you know, probably, probably report cards and things like that, that were that should not be changed unless there was a legal name change or there was a sworn affidavit by the family. And then like sort of other records um, that were just, you know, bus lists and cafeteria lists and um, just things that would be used in a school that weren't related to any sort of formal reporting or accountability, that there was less um, that needed to be done if if students wanted to request changes. That guidance has evolved and changed in PDE now. Uh, there's no real distinction between records. So um, the, the position of the department is clear now, and they actually put out guidance to folks in child accounting about how to make changes uh, for gender and name changes for students. Um, so we removed the official category, and now all records are um, treated the same, and it does not require um, documentation of a, of a legal name change. It doesn't require, you know, a sworn statement um, that, you know, from, from the student or their parent or guardian. Essentially, now, if a student uh, comes forward and makes a request uh, for a name change or to have their records amended, uh, those changes are, are honored. Um, and again, that's that is consistent with um, the law. The the um, uh, under section E, uh, the locker room accessibility. Those two paragraphs that were listed there, they they sort of said different things. And I think when this policy was initially proposed, uh, um, those were two different options where the board could have either selected the first paragraph or the second paragraph. And I think both of them inadvertently got left in. Um, so I propose striking the first one and retaining the second one since the um, second one is a little bit more um, uh, progressive with respect to how you treat um, these types of requests, which I felt would match um, you know, the board's intention here. And let me see if there's anything else. I think I think everything else was generally um, pretty straightforward and non-substantive. Those three items that I just highlighted were the main changes. And again, the, the item that we're still waiting on some clarification for is really how you handle situations when there is a dispute between parents and students about identity issues. My understanding in speaking with Ms. Keene and student services is that at least in Cheltenham, they're not seeing uh, those types of requests. Generally, I think parents are aligned and are supporting their students' choices. Um, so it's not a major issue. It's something that I think we do want the policy to address, but I do think that um, the student services department has not found uh, that they're having trouble meeting the needs of students because they are getting support from families. And Dr. Smith may have something to add there, but uh, that's my general understanding in speaking with Ms. Keene. 
Good morning. And that's your general understanding is correct. Um, however, prior to Ms. King um, coming onto the position, we did have um, two families who were in disagreement with the child and with um, help through CHOP and other resources, we were able to get family and students on the same page, but we have had that pushback since I've been here with two students. And I guess with that, we can probably open it up for yeah. questions. I imagine there may be some discussion here. Uh, Ms. Ms. Loma. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm just, just sort of curious. I know that there's a bill floating around in the state about sort of participation of transgender students, I think in athletics. Um, do, do you know sort of what the status of that is, Ed? My understanding is that there was a vote um, and I don't know, I don't believe that that bill passed in the okay. House. Okay, um, that's good. Or actually, I do believe the bill probably passed in the House with the virtual certainty that the governor would veto it. But I, admittedly, I have not seen the final action on that. So I can check on that. But I, I think the general consensus was whatever the legislature does, the governor is going to veto that bill. Okay. And All I think, right. and that's why nobody was really paying attention to it because we knew it wasn't going to go anywhere. Okay. All right. Good. I just wondered, make sure that wouldn't have any kind of impact on yeah. what we're talking about today. Thanks. Thanks, Ms. Loman. Uh, Mrs. Haywood. Um, yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Diazio. Just in terms of the policy, I just wanted, and these are probably just, you know, inconsistencies. We had changed gender nonconforming to gender expansive, and I still saw the language gender nonconforming in a couple of places in the policy. Oh, okay. We, that, that should have been, yes, we will make that change. Um, yeah, I think there were just two places. Yep. Yeah. And is the board comfortable with the um, gender expansive? I, I, I feel like I felt like the word non-conforming was not the right word to use there, which is why I thought this group would probably prefer the ex gender expansive. But if, if I missed there, let me know. You read my mind. Okay. <laughs> Right, thanks. I had that question written down as well. Um, it's also wanted to hear there's language around um, consistently asserting. Uh, just wanted to, is there any more clarity around like what consistently means? So, what I generally, I think that that's a great question. Um, the scenario that we're trying to guard against is when um, requests for changes are not made in good faith and they're on their face not made in good faith. Um, we see it very infrequently, but particularly, um, I mean, I, I've seen it come up. Uh, it comes up usually um, with middle schoolers um, who are just... Um, being middle schoolers, right? And they are, um, you know, they're not making a name change request. They're not making a, a, a pronoun change request, uh, but they think it's silly to be in different bathrooms or things like that. And what we were trying to say is through this policy is this policy is about, you know, with respect to locker room access and, and records changes, this is about identity. This isn't something that should be um, at eight in the morning is one thing and at one o'clock in the afternoon is another thing. And it's, is really, um, th th this is, this is a, this is a real issue. Um, I, I, I have not had to address that in Cheltenham and it's been a while since I've had to address it anywhere. Um, certainly what I tell clients is consistently asserted doesn't mean that the student can't um, go back and forth because that's part of a student's journey many times uh, with identity. You start out with one with one identity and then maybe you begin to explore and and you know you may go back before you move forward, right? Like it's a process. And 
student services uh, support students in that process. And this policy is not meant to prohibit any of those requests. It was more meant to just say, um, you can't just, you can't keep going back and forth every day um, when there's no indication that that's actually part of your individual journey. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, and even the shedding some light in terms of student services and the process, because that's more mm -hmm. of the scenarios I was thinking through with a student in their eyes is consistent, you know, is consistently. And then, so what does that look like um, from a district perspective? So thank you, thank you. Um, seeing no other uh, virtual hands raised at the moment uh, and neither public attendees, um, I'll move forward or hand it back. This sounds like it would move forward for uh, a first read. Um, I'll hand it back over to administration. Yes, that's correct. So the policy will move forward for a first read and the <clears throat> AR will also come back after the, um, it'll be shared on the board agenda, but it'll also come back. Oh, Ms. Haywood, you had a question. I know at the last legislative meeting, we um, were at the last actually policy committee meeting, we were talking about um, any possible gaps between the 707, I think, and the use of uh, district facilities and um, this policy 258. And I was just wondering, Mr. Diazio, whether any, was there any additional language that you thought we needed to add to make sure that there was synergy between 707 and 258 as relates to use of facilities? I think we're, um, we're in good shape with respect to 258 and 707, but with respect to um, facilities, um, the locker room accessibility language that was in the AR uh, was clarified because again, that language is a little bit, um, contradictory there. Um, and so with respect to facilities, we clarified what the district's position is there with respect to locker room accessibility. 707 is generally um, use of facilities by sort of outside organizations um, or, or outside of the school day. But with respect to facilities, your comments are right um, that we did clean up some of that language around use of facilities during the school day by students. Thank you. Yep. Okay, are we ready to move on to the next policy? Yes, thank you. Next policy is policy 711, naming of facilities change to proposed change to naming rights. Yes, so this was one that came up, um, uh, had last been updated in 2008. So it's it was due for revision. Um, this was another one where, uh, for whatever reason, the formatting in board docs was, uh, the, the, the text here was pasted in as a, as a photo image. We were having a hard time editing that language. So we pasted in new language here. Um, this policy really just contemplates that there may be circumstances where the board um, wants to uh, grant naming rights. Um, it gives some general criteria for scenarios where naming rights may be appropriate, um, but it's not a limiting list. The, the last section of, for example, the, the naming rights and recognition says that the board reserves the right to consider naming of uh, district facilities um, for circumstances that aren't necessarily outlined in the policy. So the items that you see there under naming rights and recognition, one through four, um, th those aren't the only times that you can consider naming rights. And any time that there's going to be naming rights uh, given, that's going to be a, a broader conversation with the board. This policy basically just contemplates that it may happen from time to time. There will be board discussion about it and that any funds that come in that ultimately result in naming rights being awarded, 
that those funds are treated in accordance with uh, board policy 702, which is your gifts, grants, and uh, donations policy. The reason why it was changed uh, from naming rights of facilities to naming rights is because um, it's not necessarily just facilities uh, that could be named. Um, you can name outdoor spaces, you could name just um, individual classrooms or portions of a building. It, it's not necessarily just meant to be your buildings, could be other things. Opening up for board com comments. Ms. Hayward. Um, yes, and this is um, Mr. Diazio. As it relates to the gifts, grants, and donations, I'm not having that up in front of me. Is that the one that has the, or was that the facilities policy that has a list of areas of the schools that somebody could um, have naming rights to? For example, you know, the gym, for example, at the high school, if somebody donated X amount of dollars, was that part of the facilities? I can't remember. There was an attachment to one of our policies that a whole list of areas of schools. I don't think it was 702. It may have either been 707 or would you, I may have been, we also have that commercial advertising policy, which talks about places. And I know we had some robust discussion about that policy last year. Um, 702, uh, because 702 also has some language in it about naming rights and it really probably shouldn't. So 702 is actually on, I don't know if it's May or June, but it's on one of the next two policy committee agendas. And the reason for that will be to make sure that it meshes well with 702, uh, with um, 711 here. And um, there were also some, uh, there's some procedures operationally that need to be cleaned up in 702. So the committee will be seeing that. Um, and if it's not on for next month, I'll actually suggest bumping it up so that the naming rights and the gifts, grants, and donations will make it onto the same agenda for context purposes. Okay, so great. Because we'll, we'll I, I just May. Yeah, thank you. I just remember. Um, I, I think when Kara was here, uh, either some one of the policies I know we have a list, an attachment that has a whole list of areas of the school. And um, that that somebody could, if based on their donation, I believe, okay, could name. So I just wanted to make sure that we were looking at that in conjunction with looking at this particular policy in the changes. Yes, yeah, I'll find that then before um, before the next meeting. Great, thank you. Yep. All right, thank you, uh, and. For the record, welcome back, uh, Mr. Schultz, uh, we're seeing you. Uh, and we are just uh, discussing policy 711 naming rights. Uh, seeing no other board hands raised at the moment or uh, public attendees, um, I'll hand it back to administration. Uh, this will also move forward for first read at our next legislative meeting. Uh, I'll hand it back to uh, Ms. Jackson. Thank you. The last, well, this is the last policy that we had up for discussion. Policy in AR 823, Energy Management and Sustainability were listed. However, and I'm sure Dr. Scriven may want to add, however, that policy, we wanted to first have discussion at the facilities committee meetings um, before we bring it back to the policy committee. That is correct. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Scriven. No, I just noted that was the recommendation and, and full transparency. I, I, I know that that has not happened. So I've <clears throat> directed Mr. Holman to facilitate that through the facilities committee where that will be the start point for that dialogue. Um, and me and Dr. Smith have had some dialogue because we know that 
uh, that will potentially step into the realm of, of curriculum as well to just see where those opportunities exist, where sustainability uh, will uh, would potentially live there as well. So with, with all the moving pieces, I, I've, I've not prioritized it. Let me just be very transparent with you guys. Um, but I have since given Mr. Holman those marching orders. Uh, so he'll be having dialogue to get that dialogue started. So but that's where we are. I, we need more time. Thanks for adding that for the public record. Um, uh, and for us, uh, the, the committee members were made aware prior to this. So, so thanks for that as well uh, in terms of the agenda. Um, so with that, that we have concluded uh, both old uh, and new business for today. Uh, and so um, seeing, um, oh, there's nothing to comment on at the moment. So I will await a motion, uh, motions to adjourn. So moved, Jennifer Lohman. Second, Julie Haywood. All right, thank you. Thank you to administration uh, and Mr. Diazio today for the walkthrough and overview. Uh, have a good day. Thanks, right, everybody. Thanks.